Uh, so it's vacation time, a lot of people are on vacation and many of you are going on vacation. Just want to remind you that uh, the evil one never goes on vacation, right? And uh, this is the time really where we have to exceed in our Bible reading, you know, so if you go somewhere, don't forget your Bible. People tend to forget their Bible, they think that's it, I'm going to take a break of everything and then this is when he attacks, right? And so today we're going to study the book of Deuteronomy, the reason why we have a break uh, from Jeremiah. Uh, First of all, it's because we're missing a few books, uh, on a few chapters on Deuteronomy for the radio. And also, Jeremiah is an immensely interesting book and also a very complicated book. It requires more than the usual 25 hours of preparation for a 45-minute speech, it requires over, over perhaps 40 hours because it goes by section, not by book, not by chapter, that is. And so this section overflow over the others. And so I'm going to take the time during the summer also to uh, really look at uh, this book. Also, Herb came back from a, a dance competition. I think he went to uh, London, and he stayed there a few weeks. And uh, so you have dancers that come from all over the world. And that was around the time of the tsunami. And the, there were 24 couples from Japan who came. And they, they had these things on them. It says, dance and pray on the first day, which is nice. And the day after, all the Americans had the same thing on their which is very nice. I think it was touching. Thank you, Herb, for this information. And so let's open up our scriptures to Devarim, chapter 5. That is Deuteronomy, chapter 5. You know, reading the first chapter of Deuteronomy gives us a deep sense of the importance of remembering essential facts in history, facts in our own history. In these chapters, and even until the law is fully dealt with in chapter 12, later in chapter 12, Moses constantly brings to mind those events that speak about the birth of Israel, that speaks about its election, its preservation. It also and especially recalls those historical events that describe the acts of God in the life of the nation, how she was nurtured, how she was loved, how she was disciplined as well. How much do we remember the things that God did for us? From the moment we met him and even before our conversion, surely we can remember his protective hands in our lives. This section is about a treasure chest that we forgot we owned. A treasure of promises when opened will illuminate the path we're walking and it will make the life even easier for us because we'll remember how good God is. In this book, the warning about not forgetting the blessings of God and how great our God is are numerous. For instance, the word forget plays an important role here. It is used 13 times while you do not see it mentioned in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Even the word shemar, which means to listen, it is used 65 times just in Deuteronomy, more times than all the three previous books put together. The word is translated by different English words such as beware, take heed, observe. But it is all one Hebrew word that called on the Israelites to pay attention to what was said by God. This is what Deuteronomy stresses for us. One cannot but be impressed by these repetitions that they have this power to bring historical event to a present level so that we can better face the present and the future. Let me give you some example and also a sense of the force in which Deuteronomy is written even in the Hebrew. Look at Deuteronomy 4.9. Just one chapter before. So it says, Only take heed, that is Shema, to yourself and diligently keep Shema again yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Look at verse 23. Take heed, that's the word Shema. Take heed to yourself, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you yourself a card image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. Again, look at chapter 6, 12. Again, he says, beware, the word beware means Shema. 
Shema lest you forget the Lord, Jehovah, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And the same principle should be applied to the great things that God has done in our lives. Things we so forget, I mean so fast, we forget so fast. This book of the Toronto means a reminder of these things. You know, I read an illustration that brings out well this working, the working of the words of God, and our part in reading and rereading the word as we should. You know, a teacher was asked a question by a student referring to Deuteronomy 6 6, where we read, And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your hearts. Upon your heart, the student asked, Why are we not told to put them in our heart instead of on our heart? So the teacher answers that it is not within man's power to place the divine teaching directly in his heart. And that we can do is to place them on the surface of the heart so that when the heart breaks, they will drop in. You know, there's much truth in this illustration as this repetition press hard on our hearts so that the message may sink deep into our mind. And it is my prayer that today... We allow the Spirit of God to use the words he inspired Moses to teach us. So the first four chapters of Deuteronomy is a review of the last 38 years in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 4 concluded this section with a lengthy exhortation to obedience. This chapter really is in preparation of Deuteronomy 5 where we have the Ten Commandments. These ten are really an introductory stipulation leading to the details of the Mosaic Law. Ten commandments cover every facet of the other 603 laws expounded here and which cover every facet of our lives. But there is one passage in between chapter 4 and 5. It's in chapter 4. One passage that seems at first glance to be out of place. In fact, it is a first commandment that precedes the law that precedes the Ten Commandments. It is actually the law of the city of refuge that we find right at the end of chapter 4. It's verses 41 to 43. This is where the law really begins as it sets a great precedence for the Mosaic law. Let's first begin to read verses 41 to 43 of chapter 4 and try to understand why this law is given in this section. There's, I want to tell you something really beautiful in there. Verse 41 says, And Moses set apart three cities on this side of the Jordan toward the rising sun of the sun, that the main slayer might flee there, who kills his neighbor and intentionally, without having hated him in the time past, and that by fleeing to one of these cities he might live. Bedzer, in the wilderness, on the plateau of the Reubenites, Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the Manasites. Now, why is this pas- what is this passage doing right here, right after the review of the 38 years' journey in the desert and before the Ten Commandments are given? You know, the scriptures will often surprise us with information that seems to be out of place. But there is something in this insertion that will prepare the reader to understand the overall direction of God's law that he's about to give us. Do you see that in this law of the city of refuge... The fundamental idea is the care and respect of the human being, whether he is guilty or not guilty. Do you see how God is concerned with man and strives through the Mosaic law to bring back man to one who was created in his image, something that was lost in history then? This is a great introduction of the Mosaic Law. With this law, man is not a living being that can be used and abused. With the advent of the Mosaic Law, man is seen as God's possession only. And who will be avenged is badly, if badly treated. The law of the city of refuge affirm this truth. There it is a question of dealing with life and death. This is how it begins. Through this law, we are giving an introduction of the spirit behind the Mosaic law, the importance of man, the importance of life. Let me go further. These cities of refuge were given in case someone kills another person by accident. God had already decreed in Genesis 9-6 
that whosoever shed man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. This is the reason. That is the point. We are made in the image of God. The death penalty for anyone who kills another man, why so severe? Because man was created in the image of God. With the respect and importance of man's life begins the law. But what if a man killed another man by accident, that is unintentionally? And what if this man was in turn killed, thinking, thinking that he is the murderer? Then the people of Israel will find themselves with two murders resting on the nation. In fact, the reason why these cities of refuge were created, were given, is seen in Deuteronomy 19, verse 10. God said, lest innocent blood be shed in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and thus the guilt of blood shed be upon you. He wanted to avoid these type of things. So the innocent blood is the one of the one who unintentionally killed another person. Because the life of a man is too important in the eyes of God, and because... The importance of the life of man is the underlying foundation of the Mosaic law contained in the Torah. This, I believe, is the reason why the scriptures begin with this truth even before the law is, begins. So this law prescribed that as soon as an individual killed a man, whether he was guilty or not, because this law also protected the guilty person, Right? He would run to one of the cities until the elders of the city would investigate and determine if there was murder or not. And notice, this was also very important in the Mosaic Law, that the man was considered innocent until found guilty. That was new, by the way, at that time. As opposed to the other local laws of that time, just like the law of Hammurabi. And what is most beautiful in this law is that in his great concern for the well-being of man, God, in chapter 19, speaking of the same subject, ordered that the roads leading to the cities were to be well entertained and equally spaced, and in such a way as to be reachable from anywhere in Israel, within a short, of course, period of time. And history tells us that they even put road signs on all crossings, so that man can run to the protection of justice away from the passions of man who at this time would want to take justice into his own hands. And it is after the judgment, if the person was not a murderer, the person could resume his life in the city, but he would be confined there until the death of the high priest. This was done you know, for his protection. In fact, these cities were Levitical cities, and there is a legend that says that the mothers of the priests will have food and clothing sent to the refugees so as to persuade them to pray for a long life for the high priest. Is this not a nice introduction to the Mosaic Law? See how God is so respectful of man. That is, by the way, the fundamental idea of the Mosaic Law, that man was created in the image of God. In all, there were six cities. Three were given by Moses, as we see it in Deuteronomy 5. These are cities on the east side of the Jordan, of the Jordan rivers, and three also were given, were chosen through Joshua. These are given on the other side of the Jordan. I have a map for you. They're right there. You know, we're told that throughout history, history of Israel in the land, in order to discourage avengers from going to this city, Certain trades were banned to them, such as the manufacturing of textile, of glass, and especially sales of arms and hunting tools were forbidden in this city. God wanted to protect the person. And there's much, a much deeper message in here, I believe. Notice the names of these cities. Amazingly enough, each of them point to a stage of one's salvation. As if we were all this person who inadvertently or willingly committed a transgression and there we ran to the safety of justice. A justice for which the Son of God died for and covers us with. It is in Joshua chapter 20 verses 7 to 8 where we read the six names. We can see in the meaning of each of these names a path. 
a passageway that symbolizes the experience of a man when he flees from the condemnation of sin to God. The first name we find in Joshua is Kadesh, as you see it on top left, which means what in Hebrew? Righteous, sanctified. This is the first step in salvation and pure righteousness of God. To approach God, one cannot use his own righteousness. We need to find the one he provided for us. That is through the blood of his son. The other city is Shechem. This word, by the way, is not an easy one to understand, but its main meaning really is to rise up early in the morning with the idea of being persistent, diligent, and eager. It speaks of a new life, a new beginning, a ri- the rising of a sun for a new day. And this is what is new when one runs to God in the cover of his righteousness. A new era begins, a new life where new men, new women. The third city, Kiryat Arba, it means the city of four. This one doesn't come out as clearly as the other. Four, what? We do not know. Some say four suburbs, or as the Talmud alleges, four couples thought to have been buried there. They think that Adam and Eve were buried there. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel. The number four in the Bible is the number of creation. The fourth day saw so the material creation finished, so it may speak of our actual abode. Our earth, it is our abode right now. And this was the city which was later called Hebron, where David, before he conquered Jerusalem, made it his abode. And so is this world to us before we reach the new Jerusalem where Yeshua has prepared our eternal abode. We are, in a sense, all in Kiryat Arba, waiting for Yeshua to finish his office of high priest so we may rule with him when we will exercise his office of king. We have a technical problem, I see. (laughs) So the other city is Bezer, which is actually Bezer, it's an ore, an ore of gold or silver, an ore or a small boulder that contains metal, precious metal found in their root state as it is dug out from the mines and needs breaking, cutting, and polishing just like what we need when we come to a saving knowledge of Yeshua. This is such a wonderful picture of our sanctification when we come to the Lord. The next city is called Ramoth, which means height. It means sublime, very high. Such is the effect of sanctification if properly followed. It will bring you to a great spiritual height. It will prepare you for your next life in heaven. And this is what the last city speaks about, the name Golan. You know what it means in Hebrew? Exile. Exile. When Moses says, we shall fly away and be with the Lord. And so, in the cities of refuge, we find Kedesh, the righteousness of God that he imputes in us. Shechem, a new life in him. Kiryat Arba, a temporary abode in this earth. Then Med Bedzer, which speaks of our sanctification. Then Ramoth, which speaks of our position in God, and then Golan, which is the exile, the going away to a final abode. These names, I believe, were inspired and pointing again to what the whole of the Old Testament is pointing to, that is Jesus, Yeshua, and our gathering with him, his body. These cities also point to some of the last words of Jesus on the cross, when he said, if you remember, in Luke 24, 23, 34, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. God is ready to forgive. God is ready to forgive. You know, it's amazing that the Lord begins with a city which speak about forgiveness. And these words, the Messiah gave the softer sentence of manslaughter as opposed to, to murder. In saying these words, he made himself the city of refuge. He is our city of refuge for anyone who wants to Go away from the avenger of blood. This is how beautiful the law is introduced. This is an utmost concern that is for the salvation of man. Let's now begin to look at Deuteronomy 5. Let's read verses 1 to 5. Let's see the short introduction that we find in there. It says, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. 
the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with us face to face, to face on the mountain in the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the words of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up to the mountain. You know, it's interesting to read in verse 3 that the Lord did not, it says, did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us. The fact is that this present generation was not there when the covenant was made. This generation was not the one that received the law. Yet Moses speaks to them as if they were the very recipient of these laws. Furthermore, he says in verse 4 that the Lord talked with you face to face. Again, they were not there. But then he adds something quite interesting in verse 5. And he says that he stood between the Lord and them at that time. What speak, why speak as if they were there? And what add the fact that he had to stand in between? As we're going to see throughout the book of Deuteronomy, in fact, throughout the whole law, that there was a need of a mediator. And we're going to see through the law, especially in Deuteronomy, that Moses all the time will complain and say, I cannot do the work. He was always pointing to Yeshua. This is why he says, that I was always in between you so that the people and us will realize that we need a mediator. And so this passage of Deuteronomy 5 begins solemnly here with the words, Hear, O Israel. This is an important two words. Only found in Deuteronomy where it is mentioned five times. Every time it is mentioned, something new and very serious is about to be said. And it is now that the Ten Commandments are here repeated. After that, they were given on Mount Sinai for the sake of the new generation. These ten words, as the Hebrew has it, was a sort of an introduction statement that explained the coming law that would be given. These are important commandments as they are at the foundation of our legal system and form the fundamental moral and ethical principles of the Western tradition. And it is essential to understand that the Ten Commandments were not given in a vacuum. To avoid mystifying the Ten Commandments, we should see them as part of the 613 laws of the Mosaic Law, and as an introduction of the law itself. Many seem to see them as standing solo somewhere and related to any others, and so they begin to worship the tablets instead of understanding the spirit of the law. And one reason we tend to put the Ten Commandments on a higher ground is because these are the only laws that are given to us in an apodictic way. That is, in a very systematic way, as the first, second, third, and so on. And we love what is systematic. You know why? Because we don't have to think very much. Something that does not require, that require less effort to understand. It is clear, concise. This, I believe, was attributed to the edification of the tablets. But while the Ten Commandments are given in an apodictic way, the other laws are mainly given in a casuistic way. Let me give you an example. If I say to a child, do not play with matches, that's the law. Or if I begin to explain to him what matches can do, and I tell him, you know, if you light a match, you can put fire in, actually, in this place. You can burn yourself, you can even kill people. Which one is the best one? The second one, no? Why is the second one a best one? Okay, because it calls the child to sit next to me and to assess the situation. To understand the law, one is required to dig in and to find out the meaning. Just like the law of the Messiah. By the way, we have a whole law of the Messiah. People say we can see that law. Why? Because it's not given in a systematic way. It is there. Why? Because God wants to be partner with you. He wants to sit down with you. So you may understand this law and apply it in different situations. And so many of the laws given in the Mosaic Law, as we will see later, in the law of the Messiah, are not, not so, such, so clear-cut. And I believe this is done purposely so that man is brought to deeply think about them, and in so doing, he does not become an obedient robot, but a partner with the Spirit of God. 
Remember in Jeremiah 29, we learn how we shall live in this world. There we find a letter to the exiles that God wrote to the exile. And there we are told how to live and behave in such a world. And in here, in the Ten Commandments, we are given the rules of our conduct for our journey here in the world. And so the Ten Commandments cover ten major areas. Religion, worship, reverence, time, authority, the importance of life, purity, property, the tongue, and satisfaction, contentment. Together, they all cover every facet of our lives. And they are, as they are later, expounded in the law. The Ten Commandments are divided into two sections. Let me show you another slide. The first four pertains to our relationship with God, and the last six, our relationship with man. This is exactly what Jesus says, right? In Matthew 20, 22, 36, he was asked that pertinent question about the law. Verse 36, we read, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? They ask him. Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the first part. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it, he says. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You can also see a similar division in the relationship between Psalms and Proverbs. Psalms is our relationship with God. Proverbs relationship with men. And so we can see that they are divided in two. Let's go back to the original slide. Let's see the first commandment. The first commandment. Verses 6 to 7. Deuteronomy 5. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment speaks of the exclusivity of God. This, he wants to tell you, the scriptures, in there you will find the only true religion. After all, if he is who he says he is, then the logical consequence is to have no other gods. If you believe that God is exclusive, we should have no other gods. This is not only speaking about polytheism, but also of any other monotheistic image of God what might have falsely created in his mind. So this commandment has to do with our religion and calls for an assessment of the God we believe in. There will be nothing as tragic than to find out at the end that the God you are worshipping is not the real one. Imagine the mistake. The whole of your eternal future here is at stake. How then will you find out? Consider the passages where God says, and we're going to see so many of them, where you shall not add or take off from his word. This is throughout the scriptures. If we want to know the nature of God, it's in the scriptures. It's right there. We know there's a God through creation, but to know him, we have to go to the scriptures. The scriptures is the way to find out if you are on the right track. And there's no other book in the whole of history that matches the scriptures, whether it's in prophecy or scientific or historical precision, and especially in its power to change lives. And what other gods could we have besides the Lord? Plenty. Plenty. The other gods are not these little statues one bows to. For us, it could be the pleasures of life, our possessions, or the position we hold at work or somewhere else. It could be something as mundane as your favorite sport. It could also be your family. In no way does that suggest that you should love your family or children less. But God takes first place. And then when you do this, your love for the others will be much better. And if this command is obeyed, then the nine other ones will follow as a matter of course. Because it will, you will naturally look for them. Because having a right understanding of God means the right fellowship. It means walking according to his will. The second commandment, it's a lengthy one, verses 8 to 10. It says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. 
but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this commandment speaks of worship. Once you know who God is, then you are called to properly worship him. And notice the length of this commandment. It is, I believe, because we tend to approach God in the way we want. What it says is well summed up in what Yeshua says in John 4, 24. He says, God is spirit, right? And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is why we ought not to make any physical representation of God and worship him through them, right? I understand sometimes it is difficult. And we all need something to see or touch. But God wants to have such a close relationship with us that he forbids these things. And this is why you will not find any images of worship that is any images or statues in this place. The carved images is the word for idol in the Hebrew. That is, the word is pesel, carved wood of something, something that is created. That's like when we create it in our uh, mind. And following this, is the best definition of idolatry we can have. Any form, figure, portrait, or picture, or anything, or creatures, whatever that is made to be worshipped, is forbidden. And this definition is quite fitting, since in our Bible we learn that there are, you know, 12 different Hebrew words that are represented by one English word, idol. Okay? Idolatry covers a much wider area for that one single word, that one single word can cover So there are many ways to transgress this commandment. It is anything, by the way, that is carved, carved in wood or carved in the mind. Again, what might have many different beautiful paintings and many different works of art at home, so long as they are not worshipped, they are not forbidden. In fact, you know that in the temple, you had the representation of angels braided in the curtains. They were not to be worshipped, but they were there. You know, last time I went to the internet, I want to show you another picture that I showed a couple of times before and I showed in the, on Wednesday evening. And I went to the internet and I was curious to find out, carved out, uh, that is, images of Jesus in people's mind. And this is what came out with. So here you have about 38 pictures of Jesus. Now, which one is the real one? It's the one that you have in your heart. The one you have. By the way, a few of them look like Jews, right? shouldn't be like this. Let me just go out of there very fast. Uh, There's something else here that is disturbing. How can we understand verse 9, where God says that he is a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, he says. We remember that at the beginning, we saw that Israel is considered as an entity, right? Right? The reason that the iniquity of the father was still on the children to the third and fourth generation is mainly because Israel was an indivisible theocratic state when one sin did influence not only the immediate family but the whole nation. By retrieving his influence and letting sin grow, these were then punished up to the third and fourth generation until God came back. And it is a grace that God limits the damages to the third and fourth generation and not further than that, than that. In fact, we see a contrast in the next verse where we learn that he shows mercy to how many generations? Five, six, seven, thousands. Thousands. God is seen as a restrainer always ready to pour out love whenever it is needed. But would you believe that from this passage in Deuteronomy 5, many have today came up with the doctrine of generational transfer of demons. They call it generational curses, curses on the children resulting from the father's sin. And there are a whole ministry dedicated to helping people break free from these generational curses. I want to tell you this is not biblical. Where are the demons and where are the curses here? And to pull out this conclusion from this passage just shows how loosely people will read their scriptures. There's no such thing as generational curses. Once you have the blood of Yeshua on you, no demons can come on you, right? They can harass you, but they can't come on you, in you. Now, the third commandment, one verse, verse 11. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Vain. As the first has to do with religion and the second with worship, the third has to do with reverence, with respect. 
When mentioning God's name or speaking of God or to God, it should be done with great reverence. We should avoid even mentioning God's name in vain during the day. Oh my, right? Things like that. The level of reverence will demonstrate the level of one's understanding of the God of the Scriptures. The fourth commandment, this is the most misused of all the commandments. It's a very lengthy one, verses 12 to 15. It has to do with the Shabbat. Let's read it. Verse 12, observe the Shabbat day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all the, your work. But the seventh day is the Shabbat day of the Lord your God, and in it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, or any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Shabbat day. Before we see the meaning, the great meaning of the Shabbat, you know, it doesn't matter that this is the only one of the Ten Commandments not repeated in the law of the Messiah. Many say that it is still law. You know, there's a catch here, I want to tell you. The Bible says that if you live by the law, you shall be judged by the law. Romans 2.12. And what is the punishment for not obeying the Shabbat? As prescribed in the Bible, Exodus 31, 14, you shall keep the Shabbat, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it surely shall be put to death. Can a believer be put to death because he transgresses the Shabbat? Does one realize the import of these words? If you want to observe the Shabbat, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you say it's the law, then you carry along the punishment. It's simple. Believers cannot be under this law, even if they wanted to. But they can if they want to observe the Shabbat, but not as a law. In fact, there's a lot of beauty in the Shabbat. And the underlying message here is about what? Time. This commandment speaks of time and how we manage our time and how we dedicate our time to God. Not only one day a week, seven days a week. By giving the Shabbat, God wanted the Israelites to concentrate one day a week for study and fellowship with Him and to be with one's family. And while the Shabbat is today not required, the dedication of one's time is required and required and even more so. And it goes beyond the one day and covers all of our lives. Today, Yeshua says, I am the Lord of the Shabbat. True Shabbat cannot be found and exercised apart from Yeshua. He said this in Luke 6, 5, in answer to the accusation of the Pharisees that he was transgressing the Shabbat. Yes, he was transgressing their Shabbat. But the real one is only found in the Word, is only found in Him. Now, how important is this commandment? You know, I read somewhere that it takes about uh, 70, uh, 70 hours and 40 minutes to read the Bible. Which means that if we concentrate, consecrate, that is, a Shabbat on Bible reading, just a few hours every Shabbat, we will read the Bible in less than four months. I just want to tell you what you can do with your Shabbat. Now, how long does it take one to read the whole Bible? How many of us read the whole Bible or read the whole Bible? Now, let's compare this with television watching. According to statistics, the average North American watches television 17 hours a week. That's a lot, by the way. That means that if you consecrate the time to the re this time to the reading of the Bible in less than one month, you will read the whole Bible. But let's give it half of your time, and in less than two months, you will read the whole Bible. That's a great blessing, by the way, when you read the whole Bible. See that every minute counts. And there's something else here. It has been estimated that the average North American adult is exposed to more than 500 advertising messages every day. We are, actually, when you go out and so on. I want to tell you, it affects the mind. Imagine you are exposed to 500 messages of the Holy Spirit when you read your Bible then you'll become a superman or superwoman. R Bible reading is a very important aspect of one's sanctification, one's growth. 
This is when we get to know the Lord. And in the law of the Messiah, the Shabbat takes on a much broader meaning than just a 24-hour time. See how the Spirit of God explains the concept of rest in Hebrews 4, 2-3. He says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. For the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Speak about the religious ones. And verse 3 says, For we which have believed do enter that rest, that Shabbat. Only believers in Yeshua, I want to tell you, can truly taste the true rest, the true Shabbat that we have in the Messiah. So we have entered already that rest. We have already tested of heaven when we actually sit down and take the time and dedicate that time to the Lord. Just want to bring you a practical verse concerning the Shabbat. That's Colossians 2.16. That's another law if you want, the law of the Messiah. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or in the new moon or in the Shabbat days. This works both ways and secures everyone's freedom. First, if you have chosen to follow the Shabbat, do not let anyone tell you that you're not allowed to. As long as you make it, don't make it a law. Second, if you have chosen not to follow the Shabbat, do not let anyone tell you that you have to do it. We are free when we are in the Messiah. The fifth commandment, short, look at verse 16, Deuteronomy 5:16. It says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Here begins the second set of the laws. This set has to do with our relationship with men. The first four spoke of our relationship with God, and it begins with the closest people in our lives, that is our parents. This commandment has to do with authority. It is given to preserve and protect society, because if you disobey your parents, how can you going to obey anybody else? So important a figure of authority are the parents that later on we read that cursing one's parents was a capital offense. We see it in Exodus 21, 17, Leviticus 20, verse 9. Capital offense if you curse your parents. And someone asks, what if my parents are unbelievers and try to lure me away from my belief? Whatever the case is, we ought to honor and respect our parents, even if we disagree with them. To honor them does not mean that you agree with them. The sixth commandment, short. I think, by the way, this is the shortest verse in the scriptures in the Hebrew. You shall not murder. This has to do with the value of life. Every single man belongs to God and is precious to God. This is why God imposed the death penalty for killing men. That apparently stands without parallel in the ancient Near Eastern literature and legal laws. Because by this law, man is considered, as we have seen, as created in the image of God, the proper importance as a human being, is given to him. You know, in a collection of rabbinical commentaries called uh, Mikilta, the Rabbi Ishmael, one asked the question, how were the Ten Commandments arranged, he asked. So he says, five on one tablet and five on the other. One, and the one on the tablet was written, I am the Lord your God, and opposite, on the other tablet is written, you shall not murder. This tells us that if one shed blood, it is accounted to him as though he diminished the divine image. This is clever, by the way. This is true. It is true that they are both very much related. This commandment is really about the importance of each human being as they each belong to God. The seventh commandment, short and concise, you shall not commit adultery. This has to do with purity, holiness. The family is the cell of the society. Adulter adultery will destroy it. And at the same time, will destroy the stability of the society. So important it is that the penalty for infidelity for a marital relationship is what? Death penalty. So important it is. This, you find this in Leviticus 20, verse 10. In the New Testament, by the way, there is, is that one thing that allows for divorce. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. This has to do with property. 
This is verse 19. What is yours is yours. What is not is found. If it's found in your possession is theft. There's a lot about this law as we go. I will go on uh, later on into the law. To the point that even if you find something on the floor, it's never yours. You keep it until the person comes. The person doesn't come. It's never yours. The ninth commandment, verse 20. You shall not bear false witnesses against your neighbor. This has to do with the tongue, with our words, with our statements. As we are told not to take the name of the Lord in vain, here we are told to measure our words when it comes to our neighbors. Speaking bad of people, giving a bad testimony of someone. This type of character assassinations may go as far as destroying, I want to tell you, a congregation and even a society. The 10th commandment, the last one, verse 21. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is in your neighborhood. This has to do with satisfaction, with commandment. Be happy with what the Lord has given you. Your happiness should be not in what the others have. Your happiness should be in what the Lord has given you. It is forbidden by the law to desire anything that is not in your possession. And this is a general safeguard against many other sins. These commandments are the fundamental statement of a good and wholesome society as ordered by the holy and righteous God. And so, to conclude, we see here that the Ten Commandments touches and covers all the vital areas of our lives. Religion, worship. By the way, people think they don't need religion or they don't need to worship. It's wrong. We all need something to believe. So religion, worship, reverence, time, authority, life, purity, property, tongue, and satisfaction. These are the laws of God. Let's bow our head in prayer for now. Our Heavenly Father, remind us today of the old path that you spoke about in Jeremiah, which is your word of God. Help us to know, Lord, how to worship you. Help us to know how to use our time. Help us to be pure. Help us to be satisfied with what you have given us. Remind us, remind us Lord, to be still and know that you are God. Remind us that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And for those here today needing this present help in trouble, I ask you, Lord, to display yourself to them in a great and mighty way. Let your spirit now cover each and every one here. Cover them, Lord, with his presence and give them that great peace that you promised to those who love you. And I pray, Lord, if there are some who do not know you, that they may come and say, yes, I believe you, Jesus. I believe you, Yeshua. We thank you, fathers. Father, in your presence, for your presence in your midst, as we pray in the name of Yeshua. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone. 1-888-685-5902 Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902 You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902 Website address is www. Ariel Canada, all one word, A R I E L Canada dot com. Be blessed. Shalom.